Ooh, I'm not centered. I'm going in a different direction, everybody. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna razzle dazzle. Where's my camera? Two family jokes, one Disney joke. We feel good about that? Okay. You want to flap me? That's it feels so cinematic. I know, I know, right? okay. I'm ready for my close-up, Trent. Here we go. Hi, I'm Mason Zayed, and I am not drunk, but the doctor who delivered me was. So as a result, my brain is damaged. I have cerebral palsy, but I don't want anyone to feel bad for me because I got 99 problems and palsy is just one. In the oppression Olympics, I would win a gold medal. I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm divorced, I'm disabled, and I am childless with a cat named Beyonce. I would like to tell you a little bit about my origin story. My mother looks like Julia Roberts, and my father looks like Saddam Hussein. And the way they met is so romantic. It's like an epic love story that should be turned into a movie. They're first cousins. My dad swears that the first time he saw my mother, he knew she was the one. And I remember asking him, Daddy, how did you know she was the one? And she, he said, your grandfather, he told me. And my mom had a nickname for my dad. She called him her cousin. Now, let me be clear. It was only okay to marry your cousin when you had to ride a camel for five days through the desert to find someone who wasn't a blood relative. Now, the goal is that you have a family tree, not a family wreath. So please say no to cousin love. Another thing that you should say no to is ever asking another human being if they're pregnant. That is never ever a valid question. I have one of those bellies that looks like I'm pregnant all the time. So people are always asking me, like in the before time as a comedian, I would fly like 200 times a year. And every time I went through security, the TSA would randomly select me for additional screening. So I'd go through security and the TSA agent was patting me down and she said, is it a boy? or a girl, and I said, it's Doritos, Cool Ranch. <laughs> when I was born, I was the youngest of four girls, and my parents did not think that God would be so generous as to bless them with another girl child. So they had only prepared a name for a boy. It's a fantastic name, and if you happen to be pregnant, I'm not asking, I'm just saying, feel free to steal this name. They were gonna name me Muhammad. And then when they saw that I was a girl, they decided to name me Muhammadiya, the female version of the name Muhammad. Now, Muhammad is a great name. It's the name of the greatest boxer who ever lived. But being named Muhammadiya is like being named Smurfette. So instead, they named me Maysoon. Fun fact, all Arabic names have a meaning. And when your parents don't know the meaning of your name, they lie to you. If you're a girl, they tell you, it's a beautiful flower, but only in the heaven. That's why you never see it. And if you're a boy, they tell you, it's a lion, roar. And they are lion. So I grew up thinking that my name meant Maysoon, meant heavenly flower, only to meet an Iraqi linguist when I was 27 and find out that Maysoon actually means lemur. My parents named their brown, fuzzy, shaking baby monkey, and I survived. <laughs> Another thing that the doctors told my parents was that I would never walk. Now, let me be clear. There is absolutely no shame in not walking or using any mobility device you feel frees you or gives you more independence. But when I was being raised, the world was not accessible. So my dad was determined to teach me how to walk and he had a mantra, and his mantra was, you can do it, yes you can, can. And he had two techniques. His first technique was to place my feet on his feet and just walk. His second technique was to dangle a dollar bill in front of me and have me chase it. My inner capitalist was so strong, I was running in stilettos by kindergarten. 
My name is Maysoon Zayed, and if I can can, Roots Tech, you can can. I am a comedian, actress, and disability advocate. My disability should have been isolating. The only reason it wasn't isolating was because I was really blessed and lucky to have a community that supported me, didn't bully me, didn't make fun of me, always included me. And when I was born in the United States of America at that time, if you had a pre-existing condition, you couldn't get insurance. So instead of sending me a physical therapy, my parents sent me a tap class. Instead of sending me occupational th therapy, they sent me to piano. I was very much aware that the dancing made me shake less, that it made me stronger, that it helped me with my gait. I limped because of my cerebral palsy and being able to balance on point shoes or on high heel tap shoes actually helped me. And I was super aware of that but it wasn't why I did it. I loved it. When I was 12 years old, I went to a dancer's convention with my dance class, and we got to hang out with Broadway divas. And the Broadway divas taught us a number from like Phantom of the Opera, and then they sat us all in a circle, and they told us to tell them what our dream was. And I will never forget this. I'm 12 years old, and the girl next to me said, I want to be a unicorn. And the dance team was like, you go, girl. And they got to me, and I said, I want to tap dance and say Beyond Glover's bringing the noise, bringing the funk. And she looked at me, and she said, girl, you're a cripple. Find another dream. And I had always been aware that I was disabled, but I had never had anyone tell me I couldn't do what I was doing. I was always doing what my sisters did, what my friends did, what my parents expected me to do. And I think of that moment often and think, people don't realize how connected we are because one person can change the entire course of another person's life. If I had listened to that diva and I had found another dream, I don't know if I would actually be here right now. So even when the connection is harmful, it can sometimes, never excusable, but it can sometimes get you to a place you could have never been otherwise. I was surrounded by comedy as a child, so I was an extreme drama queen when I went to Arizona State University to study theater. I was so dramatic that this is a completely, completely true and embarrassing story. I used to have um, spots on campus that I called my preferred weeping spots. And I would go sit there and weep to see if I was convincing at crying, and I was. So I graduated college, I came back to New Jersey, and there's a lot of opportunity to get cast in New York City, not to mention theater. And when I went to auditions, I could see casting directors viscerally pull back when I walked in. I had people when I walked into auditions, before I ever even said my name, they would shake their heads and say no. And I came to the realization that people who looked like me were not on TV. And what I mean by that is visibly disabled. I didn't see disabled people who looked like me. And when I did, they were always magically healed on the red carpet. But where I did see myself was in the world of stand-up comedy. So in January of 2001, I took a stand-up comedy class at Caroline's on Broadway. When I took my stand-up comedy class, I did not know I was funny, but I did know that I was a good actor. So I thought I would just skate by acting funny. And by the first day, I was like, oh, I'm hilarious and this is so much more than forcibly weeping. There is absolutely no difference between my comedic shows and my real life. What you see is what you get. It's, it's, it's just me. But I do have a non-career related dream. I would also like to learn how to talk to cats. I feel like if we could figure out the internet and like, you know, beam stuff from Jerusalem to Jersey in the same second, we could figure out what cats and dogs are saying. I don't think dogs are as interesting in their conversation points, so I say we focus on cats. So, my heritage is Scottish, 
but my dad is Snow White, and I am named after a great Arab singer, Shakira, which honors my mother's Arabic heritage. I spent every single summer going back to Palestine because my parents were like, you cannot forget your roots. You have to go back home. My parents wouldn't even go with us. They would put the badge on us, put us on the plane, send us to Palestine. My grandparents would pick us up and we would spend three months living in Deir Dwan, a village with no TV, no cell phones, no internet. And I spent my summers hanging out with my aunts and my grandmas because while the kids were like out in the olive fields playing and like riding horses, I had a mobility disorder. So I found it more fun and more comfortable to just hang out with my aunts and my grandmothers as they cross-stitched. My village in Palestine is known for cross-stitching, which is what I'm wearing right now is an example of it. And my aunts and grandmothers would cross-stitch. And I remember being seven and eight years old, hanging out with 65 and 68 years old and completely holding my own. And I didn't know at the time that they were giving me my third talent. I didn't know that I was learning to be a storyteller from women who were just telling their story. I also had what I believe is a really blessed mix of parents. My dad was the ultimate cheerleader, but my mom was a classic immigrant mother. So we don't get Bs, we get As. If my sisters were doing something, then I had to do it too. I remember the first time I ever played the disability card and it was my mom telling me and my sisters to do chores. And I went up to her and I was like, Yamma, I cannot do chores, I'm disabled. And she put a towel underneath me and had me scooch on the kitchen floor so that I always had to do what I could do. If there was stuff I couldn't do, they didn't force me. They didn't seem disappointed. They never treated me as a burden. It is honestly a very different childhood than so many other disabled people experienced. I was really blessed and lucky. My dad and I were definitely like paired together, like destiny. And my dad worked on nights and weekends so that he could take care of me until I went to school. I feel like that pairing was just so essential. My father passed away 12 years ago and literally every single day without him is boring. Like I still have fun and I still thrive, but I was like, oh, it'd be so much more fun if he was there. He dedicated himself to teaching me how to walk, but also my dad was hysterically funny. One of the greatest pranksters to ever walk this earth. So we have a holiday in America called April Fool's Day, and you're supposed to trick people on that day. And my father had the best April Fool's I will never ever forget in my life. He perfectly timed it. We were all pretty little, I would say probably like five to 11 years old and we heard an ice cream truck go by the house and my dad came running in screaming frantic put on your shoes put on your shoes your sister just got run over by the ice cream truck and so we all started waiting on our shoes and running out to the car because my dad just told us that one of us got run over by an ice cream truck and we never noticed that all four of us were together. So obviously one of us had not gotten run over and we piled into the car and he looked at us and he went, April Foolish. <laughs> and I can do stand-up comedy in Arabic because I'm fluent. And Arabic is a much, much more colorful language than English. It's so much fun to play with and having an entire different language at my access makes my art better, but I also think makes me like more receptive to all the other cultures around me. But the biggest thing that my Palestinian heritage did was it created a deep love and dedication to equality. And I think the most influential part of growing up with, you know, kind of one crooked leg in each world was knowing that equality works, it's worth it, and it's worth fighting for. I know everything about my family history because when I was five years old, my dad lined up me and my other three sisters and he decided to teach us 
are like full length tribal names. And my name was Maysoon Musa Zayed Abdul Hadi Eid Salam and Bedawi. And each one of those names is one of the patriarch in my family's names. So because I knew my whole entire name, I knew who my forefathers were. The first chapter of my memoir is all the origin stories of my grandmothers and grandfathers because like it's such a big part of who I am. I think it's incredibly interesting that my father was born in a field of sheep. My grandmother was herding. She went into labor by herself, gave birth by herself, and came back with him and the sheep. And I think the reason that I'm so connected to my grandmothers is because I spent the summers there and they told me their origin stories. My advice to the youth of today who don't think that learning about ancestry and heritage is it that interesting and worth it is stop talking, put down your phone, and listen to old people. When you let the elders speak, they will tell you stories you can find no place but their minds. And when you let them speak, you can then take those stories and learn from them as well as pass them along. Facebook's not enough. And one of my favorite things I ever learned was my dad's name is Musa. Everyone in the world calls him Musa. But when I was about 13 or 14, my grandmother revealed to me that his name was actually Abdul Aziz. And that when he was four years old, she had changed his name to protect him from an evil eye. She claimed that a woman had come into the village one day and said that Abdul Aziz, her son, was the cutest child she had ever seen. And the next day, my dad got sick. So the next time the woman came to town, she was like, where's that cute baby, Abdul Aziz? And my grandmother was like, I don't have a kid named Abdul Aziz. And the woman saw my father and she was like, isn't that him? And my grandmother said, no, his name is Musa. And his name was Musa until the day he died. My father spent 50 years in the United States of America, but miraculously he died at the Dead Sea and is buried in Palestine. So when we went to get his death records, nobody could find it. And we spent weeks and weeks trying to get my dad's death record. And it was ridiculous because the event had just happened probably, you know, a month earlier. And out of nowhere, I remembered and I was like, his name's not Musa, it's Abdul Aziz. And that's how we were able um, to find everything. But I still find it fascinating that like, my mom was born in a village where girls didn't go to school after the sixth grade, but they sent her to a Catholic school. Uh, and she was taught by nuns and she graduated high school and came to America and graduated college and got a master's degree and became a chief of lab. Like, it's so incredible that you can go from one generation being completely illiterate to the next generation having a master's degree. There's so many different steps that have to happen for me to be here. Like, my grandfather was from Dedwan. My grandmother was from Betin. My grandfather was walking from Ramallah to, uh, to back to Dedwan. He passed through my grandmother's village. He saw her hanging clothes on a clothesline and said, that's who I'm gonna marry. And from that moment of that man taking a walk from the village to the city, this entire generation of people were created. I exist because of one stroll between a village and a city. And I think knowing what they went through and where I am now, it doesn't just inform me who I am, but it's a constant reminder of how incredible this world is and how much potential one person has to change the entire universe. Even if you're an illiterate woman in a village hanging clothes. My legacy is extremely, extremely important to me because I didn't have children. I tried to have children, I tried to adopt, it didn't work out. So I don't have children. So I believe that the only thing that will be left when I'm gone is my legacy. And what I want my legacy to be is equality, specifically for people with disabilities. I think it's really important that we always remember it's up to you to create a positive legacy. What's interesting is, it's a choice of a lens. 
I choose to view the world through the lens of comedy. So it allows me to take things that anger me or scare me and make them palatable and understandable. Comedy helps me connect with people. There's power in numbers. When you choose connection, you can do so much more, be more effective, and I believe have more joy.